Hey there, visual economic community. Take note, because over the next few years, the economy of the most influential country in Europe could be about to make a 180 degree turnaround. It is time to worry about Germany's economy. The country's economic golden age could be coming to an end. Over the last few years, and especially after the famous financial crisis of 2008, Germany has been the great industrial and economic power in Europe. Germany has basically been the great benchmark of the continent, the model to follow, and the one in charge of supporting the rest of the lagging countries. However, I'm afraid that this leadership, this economic bonanza, could be about to come to an end. According to many experts, Germany could be on the verge of facing one of the worst economic crises in recent history. Germany set to enter recession in 2023 with 0.4% decline in GDP. In this video, we will tell you why so many economic analysts are so concerned about the German economy. We will explain the serious problems facing the German nation. And finally, we will talk about possible solutions for avoiding disaster. Are you ready? Let's get started. Surely we are not saying anything new if we say that the war in Ukraine has dealt a heavy blow to the economies of all European countries. From Spain to Finland to Austria, Poland and Hungary, the effects of inflation and energy shortages have hit hard. This is something that, seemingly, should affect all countries equally. In other words, Germany should not necessarily be much worse off than other European countries that are also affected by the war. However, the truth is that Germany has a critical vulnerability that makes it particularly fragile to the consequences of war, much more so than other countries. Check this out. What you are seeing on the screen represents how production costs have evolved for German industry after the outbreak of the conflict in Ukraine. Basically, what this graph means is that it costs German factories 80% more to produce the same products today than it did just one year ago. And guess what? This is a huge problem for Germany, a much bigger problem than for other countries. You see, unlike European economies such as the United Kingdom, which is very service sector oriented with companies that you have all heard of, such as Barclays and Vodafone, the German economy is an economy much more dependent on industry. What's more, if you think of famous German companies, you may only think of industrial companies like Volkswagen, Bosch, or Siemens. All of them are big manufacturing companies. Companies that need cheap energy to produce, to function, and to remain competitive. To give you an idea, the importance of industry in the country is so great that this sector employs almost one out of every three employees in the country, and also accounts for more than 30% of the annual revenue. Now then, why is an increase in industrial costs so serious? I mean, more costs for companies maybe means less profit it's for entrepreneurs, maybe it means price increases, but is it really such a catastrophic problem as many point out? Well, the truth is that it is. Since the war in Ukraine, and as you can see in the graph, German manufacturing output has plummeted. And the question is, why has such a debacle occurred? Well, because after the increase in energy costs, many companies are no longer profitable and have decided to stop production. For example, ArcelorMittal, the world's largest steelmaker, suddenly stopped production at its two industrial plants in northern Germany last year. And of course, if industries close down, if they stop their production, where do you think all their workers will end up? Basically, on the street. The situation is so desperate that the coalition government, of which the Green Party, the anti-nuclear energy party par excellence, is a member, has decided to extend the life of two nuclear power plants that were due to be closed at the end of 2022. All this, of course, while business confidence has gone from bad to worse. German business confidence stuck at lowest since May 2020. However, stop. Let's pause for a moment. Because what if I were to tell you that the problems of German industry are not just a consequence of the war? What if I were to tell you that, in reality, this great German crisis goes back much further than the conflict, and even much further than the pandemic? You don't believe me? Well, look again at the graph. A moment ago, we said that because of the war and high energy costs, German industrial production has collapsed. But if you look at it, even before the arrival of the pandemic, German industry was even worse off than it is now. The war has not been a trigger for the industrial crisis. At most, it has been an accelerator. The truth is that Germany's problems go back much further, and everything indicates that no matter how soon the problems of the war are solved, no matter when energy becomes cheap again, Germany will still have great challenges to face. But what exactly are these problems? What is the disease that is affecting German industry? And is there a solution? Well, let's take a look. The Brick to the Machine 
Just a moment ago, we said that the German economy is characterized by a high level of industry. The question is, who are the customers of German companies? Is it the Germans themselves who trade with each other? Is it perhaps the German government itself that buys their products? Well, no. The main customers of German companies are foreign countries. Whether you are Spanish, Argentinian, or Australian, you have surely seen Volkswagen cars thousands of times. I'm sure you've seen Bosch refrigerators or washing machines. And even inside your cell phone, I'm 100% sure there will be a multitude of components that were manufactured in Germany. The interesting thing is that in order for that to happen, German companies must be able to have freedom of trade. They must be able to sell without taxes and restrictions to all countries in the world. And it turns out that until a few years ago, global trade openness was in its finest hour. More and more free trade agreements were being negotiated. Tariffs were being reduced more and more. And basically, Germany was increasingly able to sell its products to other countries. Proof of this is that at the beginning of the last decade, trade barriers against Germany remained at very low levels. However, look at what happened as of 2018. Since that year, trade restrictions have skyrocketed. In 2020 alone, nine times more trade restrictions were imposed than in 2012. That explains why, going back to the graph of industrial production, it started to plummet from its peak precisely from 2018 onwards. Be that as it may, the question is, why did international trade suddenly start to collapse when everything was going so well? Who is to blame for all this? Well, visual economic community, pay attention to this news. The US-China trade war has become a cold war. When Donald Trump came to power in the US, he did so with a clear objective to protect his domestic companies from foreign competitors. To that end, Donald Trump launched an entire trade war that virtually affected the entire rest of the world. Trump pushed for new tariffs on imports of steel, aluminium, and European cars. He also limited the arrival of dozens of Chinese products, and even prohibited Google from supporting Huawei cell phones. Worst of all, after Trump's trade offensive, the rest of the country started to respond with more and more tariffs, and to protect their own industries even more than the former US president did. Something like an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, and multiplied by two. The question is, who were the worst? affected by this trade war. Well, countries with high levels of international trade, as is precisely the case with Germany. In fact, Germany is the Western country that has received the most trade barriers in the last year. This is why, from 2018 onwards, German industrial companies no longer found it easy to continue selling abroad, and hence their decline began. But do you want to know the worst? The worst thing is that the European Union itself made the problem even bigger. You see, in a report by the Vienna University of Economics, it is explained that for the past few years, the European Union has been using its trade policy to fulfill political objectives that have nothing to do with trade. Objectives in areas such as environmental protection, such as public procurement regulations, or even foreign policy objectives. I need not remind you of the huge sanctions against Russia or the trade restrictions on the United Kingdom after Brexit. Be that as it may, and whether we are for or against such political intentions, what is certain is that all these restrictions have added fuel to the fire of the international trade slump initiated by Donald Trump, and not surprisingly, have considerably harmed the German economy. Increasing protectionism is already leading to a loss of prosperity. Per capita income in Germany was about 1.6% lower than it would have been under constant trade policy conditions. Report of the Vienna University of Economics. When the United Kingdom left the European Union, it did so precisely for reasons such as this. The British felt that Europe was weighing them down commercially, and they preferred to leave rather than accept the protectionism that has been so characteristic of the old continent lately. Now, do you know what? In spite everything we have just told you today, I'm afraid there is still a third major factor that could take the German economy downhill in the next few years. It's not all over and done with here. Pay attention to the following statement. There are limits to adding value in manufacturing. If you want to be rich and move up the value chain, you need to be in services. David Cole, Deputy Chief Economist at Jules Baer Bank. When you look at which are the richest countries in the world, without taking into account countries with a huge dependence on natural resources or advantageous tax zones, the front runners we find here are the USA, Iceland, and Denmark. All of them are considerably richer countries than Germany, but they are also all countries with a much smaller industrial sector than Germany. For example, if we had said that the industrial sector in Germany occupies more than 30% of GDP. In Denmark, it only occupies 23%. Iceland, less than 20%, and in the USA, barely 19%. The question is, if these countries have relatively little industry, then where do they get the money? 
Well, the answer lies in the service sector. Companies like Google, Apple, Amazon, they are among the largest in the world. In fact, they are companies that generate an economic activity as large as that of entire countries. And no, that is no exaggeration. In the last year, Apple has generated almost $400 billion in sales and $100 billion in profits. Figures equivalent, respectively, to more than eight and two times the GDP of a country like Bolivia. In any case, the important point is that, in some way, the growth margins of an overly industry-dependent model may be coming to an end. In the same way that the industrial countries once overtook the agricultural ones, the service countries now seem to be the new global benchmarks. And all this without taking into account that, with the growth of rival economies such as China and and India, it is possible that the competitive advantages of German industry could become progressively worse. In other words, if Germany wants to keep moving forward and wants to remain a huge economic power, it probably needs to adapt to the current times. Perhaps limiting itself to manufacturing cars and machines could end up dooming it to stagnation. In any case, does all this mean that the German economy is finished? Will Germany be the new sick man of Europe with nothing to prevent it? Is there a solution to the tough challenges facing the leader of the old continent? Well, let's find out. A door to hope? attention to the following statements. I don't think we're going to see a medium and long-term structural crisis, even though the country is probably headed for a recession. We can rely on the ability of German industry and especially the Mittelstand to innovate and adapt. Thomas Gross, the chief executive officer of Lender Helaba. What I'm going to say now is something that we have already explained in depth in a previous video on this channel. But to sum it up, if Germany is a rich country, it is not because it has low taxes. It is not because it has very liberal regulations, nor because it embraces a Swiss or Irish style capitalism. If Germany is rich, it is largely because its education system creates students who are well adapted to the labour market. It is also rich because its companies and its government invest heavily in research and development. And it is also rich because its political and civil structures are among the most stable and professional in the world. This is something that has enabled Germany to overcome practically all its crises in the last hundred years. The First World War, the Second World War, the oil crisis. What's more, Germany was among the very few countries that managed to get richer after the 2008 financial crisis. But how was the German nation able to get ahead after all these dark periods? At the end of the day, if you have the best companies, the most qualified workers on the continent, and the government offers sufficient stability for investment and development, it is much easier to get ahead. The key has always been to adapt talent and innovative potential to the current times. And the truth is that everything points to this being the new objective of both industry and German government. The already strong German industrial sector is on the way to a successful conversion. The German government's goal is to support the private sector and scientific institutions in the implementation of Industry 4.0. In the same vein, another element of vital importance for Germany's future is its tight control of finances. Both German public and private indebtedness are very, very low, and this is good for two reasons. The first is that, in the face of the current crisis, the German government will be able to promote public containment programs to support the industry in its period of conversion and adaptation to the new challenges. Do you want an example? Well, it has recently been announced that German companies will have a fund of 60 billion euros in interest-free state loans to meet energy bills. Beyond that though, another key element of optimism, which is likely to allow the German economy to adapt to the changes, is that, thanks to its low debt and huge savings, both companies and government have large amounts of money to invest in R&D and innovation. In short, although German industry faces enormous and tough challenges, it has room to innovate and adapt in time. But what about international trade? Well, the truth is that this is a much more swampy terrain, but there are some indications that international trade could be liberalized again in the next few years. There are several agreements in the pipeline that Europe is hoping to finalize, including with Australia, Chile, Mexico, and Canada. Even trade negotiations with India were relaunched earlier this year after remaining stalled since 2013. Observer Research Foundation. The Biden administration announced on Saturday that it had reached a deal to roll back tariffs on European steel and aluminium. Be that as it may, at Visual Economic, we don't have a crystal ball. We don't know what will happen in the future. We have already put Germany's challenges and opportunities on the table, and now it's your turn to have your say. Do you think Germany will succeed in overcoming the hurdles facing its industry? Will we see a new wave of openness in international trade in the coming years that will boost Germany? Are there other challenges or opportunities for Germany that you consider important that we've not discussed in this 
this video? Well, you can leave me your answers in the comments. If you like the video, please like it, subscribe, and hit the little bell icon if you don't want to miss any of our upcoming videos. For our part, that's all for now, and we'll see you in the next video. See you very soon. Thank you.